All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. To say Jesus Christ is the same as saying Jehovah's Messiah. Christ is Messiah. This will not shock you because you've been coming, maybe all of you, for quite a while. It certainly would be a shock to the outer world to learn who Messiah is. But I am telling you from my own personal experience who he is. We are told in scripture he is the son of God. I am telling you tonight who the son of God really is. And you will never in eternity find another son. Not in eternity. You and I were taught as Christians that Jesus Christ differs from something entirely different from that of the Old Testament. Yet he is made to say, I have come to fulfill Scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. Then beginning with Moses and the Lord, and the prophets, and the psalms, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He came only to do the will of God. And with the 40th psalm, we are told, I delight to do thy will, O God. Thy law is within my heart. This is the psalm of David. It's the 40th psalm. I delight to do thy will, O God. In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, the same author that gave us the book of Luke, we are told, and this is the Lord speaking, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Confirming the 40th Psalm, which is the Psalm of David, I delight to do thy will. But I am telling you from my own experience, the day is coming, and I hope is in the immediate present that you will be set free. You'll be set free only as you find David. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. For who are you? You are God the Father. That's who you are. You came down and became man. But before you came down and became man, you had prepared a way for yourself to return. And only your son, which is the result of your experiences in manhood, the result is David. And when you see the result of your experiences, and know then, like memory returning who you are, you are set free. As told us in the book of Samuel. He has promised to set the father of the one who destroyed the enemy of Israel. To set that father free. And so he inquired, and who inquired? The king, but the king was insane. His name was Saul. He couldn't even remember that he met the lad and met the father of the lad prior. Here in the 16th chapter, he's asked the father of the lad to let the lad serve him. In the 7th, he's inquiring. In the 17th chapter, whose son are you, young man? Inquire whose son whose lad is stripping you. 
no one knows. Because Saul is an insane man, as we are. You are not confined in some institution, but if you have lost your memory as to who you are, you are insane. You are suffering from amnesia. And in this case, although we are not violent, we are suffering from total amnesia. Because we do not know our only son. That only son is David. Named in the New Testament as Jesus Christ, which is Jehovah's Messiah. And David is the Messiah. Rise and anoint him, for this is he. And then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that moment forward. He never lost the battle because the Spirit of the Lord was with him. So to find David, what else is worthwhile in this world? Maybe tonight you could use, and who cannot use, a fortune. Any one of us tonight could use an extra sum of money, no matter what it is. If I had tonight millions, I could still use another few. If you had only a few thousand, you could use a few thousand more. Everyone can use it, but what is that compared to the finding of the sun? For the sun makes you free. You are free indeed, as told you in the 8th chapter of John. If the sun, a man is looking for the sun, and he is complacent, he is satisfied, because he's been taught to believe one called Jesus Christ. Born 2,000 years ago is the son. He has completely accepted that. He believes that. And he thinks that is going to set him free. It will not in eternity set you free. You must find in the spirit David. And David in the spirit is going to call you father. And when he calls you father, your whole memory returns. And that is God, a witness. You rise from the grave first, and still you do not know the Son. You are born from above, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, born of yourself. You came out all by yourself. Yet you are not free, not until you find the Son. And when you find them, it's told you in the form of a parable. Why this, your brother, he was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. And the one who complained never left home. He remained in the land of innocence. He never entered the world of experience. You entered the world of experience. And having gone through all the fires of this world, you come out as God the Father. And being Father, there must be a Son. And the Son, may I tell you, is David. I will state it a thousand times over. There is no other Son. God and His Son is the drama in this world. You, sound asleep and completely oblivious as to who you are, suffering from total amnesia, and only one thing in this world can ever bring back to you your memory, and that is the discovery of David. And when you find him, suddenly memory returns, and the whole thing unfolds within you, and you are the one who conceived the plan and did not pretend that you are man, you actually became as we are, that we may be as you are. So you became man, that man may become God. But prepare the way for your return to your own Godhead. Now you are told, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven. Is perfect. The word perfect is careless. 
which means the end. It comes at the climax. It means to reproduce faithfully the original. That God is the original. He comes down into this world and in man reproduces faithfully himself in man. And then he awakes having reproduced it so that his son in the beginning recognizes it and brings back into his eternal being all of us. Everyone will awake. I can conceive of failure. I can conceive of one being in this world failing because God the Father is in him. Even if he died as a little child, he wants breathing. That breath was God. Nothing is impossible to God. The most horrible beast that walks the face of this earth in the form of man cannot fail to awaken. I do not care what it is. Every being in this world, male and female, will awaken. And when they awaken, it's because the sun appeared. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So in the fullness of time, he sends his Son into our heart, crying, Father. And then in that moment in time, the Son appears. He was always within us. The whole vast thing takes place within the immortal head of man. And so when you depart having come the sun, you'll be part of the watchers, watch everyone in the world, and they're all your brothers. And you will know that what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be. And is productive of the most grateful consequences to those to whom it seems to be. Even of torment, despair, and eternal death. But divine mercy will step thee on and redeem you in the one body called Jesus. And Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is the word meaning Jehovah. Christ is Messiah, the Son. So Jesus Christ is simply Jehovah's Messiah. That Messiah is David. Jesus is the Lord God, Jehovah. His Son, if he is the Father, he has a Son, and the Son is David. There is no other Son. So David in the Spirit calls him my Father. My rock, the rock of my salvation. He calls him my God. So that Jesus is the man that is born from above. And the man born from above is Jehovah. It is God the Father. And if he's a father, there must be a son. Where is my son? When the son comes. And he's David. And David brings back your memory and you are set free. For if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. This is the great mystery of the Christian faith. It's a mystery not to be kept secret, but it is mysterious in character. Scholarship is not enough to grasp the mystery of Scripture. In fact, when Paul sets out the eight Right in the kingdom of heaven, he put the wise, wise men at the bottom. People completely misunderstand what it means to be one who speaks in many tongues. That's the scholar. Has the thing with all this nonsense that people throw themselves into a trance and then utter, bringing the liar to their mouth. Has a thing to do with that. He mentions eight divisions. And you'll read it in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 
The first is the apostles. That's always the first. Then the prophets. Then the teacher. Then the miracle worker. Then the healer. Then the helper. Then the administrator. And then those who speak in divers terms or tongues. The scholar who will take our script and year after year they'll bring them back into their original position because men invariably interfere with them. More so in the past than today because today we have print and we can set a type and reproduce the thing over and over. But in the past, until the middle maybe the 15th century, everything was script. Everything was copied. Well, a man couldn't take these volumes and copy them accurately, so he not only miscopied, but he also inserted his own opinion. So the scholars who understood the vast background of language could take them and bring them back into their seeming original form. Yet they are the last in the ranks in heaven. The first is the apostle. Well, who is the apostle? The one who is called and sent. That's the apostle. You are called into the presence of the risen Lord. You answer the question he asks you, which is the highest of all. It's above all the rights, for love is the greatest of all. You could be an apostle. You could be the prophet. You could be any of these mentioned in the eight ranks, just as we have in government. We come down from the head down to the very lowest. In the army, we go start with the general, come to the private. We have it in the social world. But above all these ranks hangs love. And so everyone one day will be embraced by the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all, and that being is love. So all will be equal in spite of the part we play in the world. So let no one pull his rank on you. So he's been sent. Well, all right, so he's sent. And maybe he is a prophet. And maybe he is a healer. And maybe he can work miracles. But let no one pull any rank on you. Because eventually you are going to be part of the body of God. And God's immortal body is love. All will then be members of the body of God. The one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. So let no one pull his rank on you. Because I have been called and I have been sent. I am an apostle. I stood in the presence of the risen Lord. And he asked me to name the greatest thing in the world. And I answered in the words, in the words of Paul. Faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love, and that's the embracement. And our bodies fused, and we became one body, without loss of identity. I was not absorbed into some world soul. I was one with that body of love, one with that spirit, one with that God and Father of all, but no loss of identity. Then I was sent. To be called is to be sent. But it was the embrace of love that was the important thing. For that is above all ranks of the world. So here, the day is coming, and I do hope it's soon for everyone here, when you will find the Son. And when you find him, he is David. David of biblical faith. The David mentioned in the book of Samuel and the book of Chronicles. The David of the storm, that is the David of whom I speak. The one that could say, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. This is the David of whom I speak. And he is the son of God. And Jesus Christ, if Jesus is Jehovah, and Christ means Messiah. That is the anointed one. And who was anointed? Was it not David? Rise and anoint him. That is he. And from that moment forward, the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him and possessed him. And he lost not a battle. 
for the Spirit of God went with him. So this is our destiny. You and I are destined to awaken as the being that we really are. Now the word called purpose is talos. It simply means the end, the climax. It always comes at the end. And you will be saying these words. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Now return unto me the glory that was mine. The glory that I had with thee before that the world was. That's what you were saying. You're only asking for the return of what you gave up to come down into the world of death. I finished the work. That's what the word tells me. To finish it, to accomplish it. And having finished it, I'm only asking for the return of what was mine before that the world was. And glory means God himself. Glorifies thou me with thine own self. With that glory which I had with thee before that the world was. So what on earth could anyone ask for, comparable to the discovery of the sun which brings his memory back? For we all suffering from amnesia. If I could only remember that I am the father, and therefore as father, there is a son, and find a son that could in some way call me, and then bring back my memory. And he does. He calls you. And your memory returns, and here you stand before your own son. Your only son. And then you know exactly who you are. And you know how you did it. Before that the world was, you prepared the way for yourself to be done. And he, your son, did everything that you willed him to do. And now you would not leave his soul in hell. You redeem him. And you bring him back. And you and your son return. Now the son is the sum total of all the experiences of humanity. Fused into a single whole and projected, personified, and it comes out as David. And that is David. You cannot blame anyone for not completely accepting the false concept that we have given to the world as we teach scripture. Those who are grounded in the Old Testament, you can't blame them for not unless they have the experience. When they have the experience, they will not go along with the traditional Christian concept. They will see their own wonderful state unfolding. That that Old Testament actually is true, it unfolds. And it is true in the new, but not as taught by those who teach it. They teach it entirely different. It's not so at all. God is the only reality. There is nothing but God. And God is love. And God is the Father. And as a father, there must be a child. And that child happens to be a son. And that son happens to be David. And so I am telling you what I know from my own experience. I have not speculated. I have not theorized if today we go back 2,000 years, we think the most important people who lived in the first century A.D. would be the Caesars and the mighty powers of that day. They would be unknown fishermen. Name the others. The unknown fishermen of that century were the most important. So he comes into the world, and man by his wisdom did not know God. So it pleased God by the foolishness that I preach, said Paul, to tell you of the mystery of God. And the weakness of man, he uses that. And the humblest of man, and he uses that. And not all the false pride of the world. Today we give awards to this one for being the best dress. Well, she can afford a hundred thousand a year to dress it. The other one can afford another fortune for something else. 
and we give all these awards every year. Ask me next year who was mentioned this year. They say just as shadows say. But we go back 2,000 years, an unknown fisherman were the most important people that walked the face of the earth. And he called them one by one. And as he called them one by one, he embraced them and sent them. No one can be sent unless he's first called, and when he is called, he is embraced. But who embraced him while he was on earth? No. After he departed this world, it's the risen God that calls them. The risen Lord calls them. And when you're called into this, may I tell you, the story is so altogether true. There is here the angelic being with a recording book. How on earth could that be seen by Daniel? And it's true. Here is a book that tall, a book that wide. And here she stands, or rather she is seated at a desk, not unlike this, but it's a great one. And she is recording, the recording angel. And when you are called into this divine assembly, you stand at her side and she looks at you. She doesn't say one word to you, she just simply records your name. She checks off you, then you are taken in spirit into the presence of the risen Lord. The ancient of days, that's who he is, as described in Daniel. And he asks you the simple question, what is the greatest thing in the world? And you answer automatically as though you were divinely prompted. Faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. He actually embraces you. He has hands, he has a face, he has a mouth, he asks your question. And here he embraces you, and you feel as though you took a drop of water and dropped it into a bowl of water. It disappears in it without loss of identity. It becomes a bowl, and yet it is still individualized. I did not cease to be aware that I am the being that I thought myself to be. Yet I felt the ecstasy of the union. That was union. That was the true baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then I was placed in the presence of another who was infinite power. And it was he who sent me. But he is the same one who embraced me. For God is a protean being. He assumes any form that suits the purpose of the moment. So when I was sent, power sent me. When I was embraced, love embraced me. That is for eternal. As told in the eighth of Romans, nothing in eternity can separate us from the love of God. So another thing that I will go through, having been sent, can separate me from that union with love. But I was sent not by love, I was sent by power. It seemed to be almighty power when he sent me. Down with the blue God, not the social structure. Done with all external worship. It simply is an expression meaning all church protocol. Everything that is something on the outside done with it. It has nothing to do with reality. All the things you see when you go to church and all the crosses and all the things done with it. Not tear it down. Ignore it. It has nothing to do with reality. So power sent me to tell you what I am telling you. But love first embraced me. And therefore I am persuaded that not a thing in this world can separate me from the love of God. No matter what I go through, it can't separate me from the love of God. But I am telling you, you are God the Father. You will not awake until the sun appears. That moment in time when he appears, your memory returns. And you recognize him in the most intimate, marvelous manner. And no power in the world could shake your confidence in this union of father-son. 
is the return of memory. Amnesia vanishes and your godhood returns. But you know, everyone is going to have the identical experience. You cannot vote as you're told in the first chapter of Corinthians. I think it's the fourth chapter. I mean the first Corinthians, fourth chapter. What have you that you did not receive? If you receive it, where can you boast? Of what could you boast? How could I stand before you and boast that I was embraced by God when it was a gift? God gives to himself. So I can't boast I am not better than if I precede you in a chronological order. I can't precede you in importance. Because they're all one. Everyone is God. So if I preceded you, which undoubtedly I have by a few years, it's twelve years this coming month that it happened to me. It could happen to you tonight. It may happen to you at the end of a section of time. But when it happens, you have to be one with me. I can't be better than. And time will mean nothing if I preceded you in time. It has nothing to do taking precedent over you. Because we are one. God is one. So here, the whole thing unfolds within man. The skull of man. The immortal head of man. That's where the whole drama is. If you dwell upon this, may I tell you, you will have the courage to face everything in this world. If business is slow, what does it matter? If someone that you love dearly is fading before your eyes, or as you know, she or he is still the being that you are. But nothing dies in this world. And so it really doesn't matter. If they fade and they dis disappear from your will, it still doesn't matter because you are loved and he or she is loved. And all in the end are one. All are one. So you are encouraged to go through all the fires of the world, all the hell that one can put upon him. Because we are all one. And we cannot come out until we are perfect. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that perfect means simply fully made, fully grown, a full man. And a full man is God. God is man. But no one tell you that he is not. He is not some impersonal oversoul God is man. Man not knowing this, on this level, he thinks he is some peculiar impersonal force. He is not an impersonal force. Very personal. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. And all are contained within this one. So I ask you to be patient. And if you can completely grasp all that I am trying to say, believe me. I am telling you what I know from my own personal experience. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. I have no intention whatsoever to set up some workable philosophy of life. I have no ism, no desire to set anything in motion to perpetuate what I'm talking about. If anyone has that desire, let them have it. But I have none. I do know that it will last and last and last and grow, just as it grew 2,000 years ago. For the time has come to tell you the truth concerning the sun. We have had it now for 2,000 years, a misconception of who God really is. Jesus is the Lord God Jehovah. 
And the Lord God Jehovah is a father. And the father has a son. And that son is David. That is the David of biblical fame. And one day you will know it. And you'll be so thrilled you can conceive of the ecstasy that is yours when you see David. And David calls you father. And then you go back into your own words because you dictated the words of scripture and fell asleep. You are the author of the book. In the volume of the book it is all about me. I delight to do thy will, O my Lord. It's all about me. The father and the son. This is the relationship. And then when it happens to you, you'll tell it. But I am now telling you from my own experience, the unborn generation will take what you hear tonight and tell it, and tell it, and tell it. I mean unborn generations throughout the centuries, for I have been sent to tell it. The year was 1929 when I was called. 1929 I was called and sent. I did not understand anything concerning the mystery that happened that night. But he takes the lowest of men, the humblest of men, not the scholars. He takes those that no one would ever suspect. And if he takes you, well then he's with you. And he imposed himself within you. So in due time, 30 years later, he imposed himself within me, 1959. But in 30 years, in preparation with England, like a gestation, and then suddenly, he rose with England, then I knew who he was. He came to me as one unknown, yet one who in the most wonderful, miraculous manner, allowed me to experience who he is. When I experience who he is, I realize I am he. They were not two of us then, just one. I was all alone in the two wherein I was married. And I didn't realize throughout the years that I was the one spoken of in scripture. That I was the buried one. Now let me comfort you. We have been crucified with Christ. Not just a single being, we have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of that Son of God who loved me, his Father, and gave himself for me. He died to bring his Father back. This is part of the drama. The Father and the Son. Only God to do it. There's nothing but God in the world. God is playing every part in the world. And in the end, when he awakes, his beloved David stands before him. The sum total of the Father's experience through death. And he conquers death. He comes out of death as the immortal being that he is. If you know of anything in this world worthwhile more than what I've told you tonight, name it for me. If tonight you own the earth, and death, may I tell you, is inevitable, what would it matter what you own? If you were the most famous person in the world, what would it matter if death terminates it? I tell you that you are an immortal being infinitely greater than any outside man in the world. No position could ever be given to you, comfort to the being that you really are. You are the immortal God. You are God the Father. If anyone should doubt me tonight, I would not question you. I only know this much. I'll meet you in eternity and we'll laugh at your doubts. I would not care if you doubted or not, 
will meet in eternity. There be no need, need for forgiveness because we will simply be hilarious that in your present state of consciousness you could doubt that you are the being I'm telling you that you are. Having awakened from the dream of life, I'm telling you who you are. And so should you doubt it, I will only have to wait. And I will wait patiently and then embrace you lovingly as my brother. For we're all brothers. It takes all the brothers to form God the Father. Everyone is a brother. And together, collectively, he formed God the Father. See, the word Elohim is a plural word. It's a compound unity. One made up of others. We are the others. We are the brothers. So in the beginning, God, that word is Elohim, it's a plural word. Let us make man in our image, that's a plural word, and the word is Elohim. So we are the ones who make it in our image. They must be faithfully reproduced, what? The original. We are the original. They must be faithfully reproduced to expand the glory that is ours. When it's faithfully reproduced, then it's perfect. Then you awake. But you've expanded by reason of the experience of coming into the world of death. Now, if this is not practical tonight, may I tell you, it's far more practical than anything that you will ever hear in the world. In the morning's paper, you read prominent names. It's always prominent if it's in the theatrical world and base, or it has money. It doesn't ask you how you got the money, but if you could leave, say, 50 million tonight, even though you stole the 50 million, you're going to get a long, long victory tomorrow. But you aren't going to take it with you. You're going to leave your 50, whatever it is, for others to either spend or invest as they do. But they aren't going to take it with them. I ask you to leave no because now you know who you are. Live so that your mind can store a past worthy of recall. Or you can simply leave a little thing behind you, but you're going to take over your past. I'll know, you will know, when you go beyond. In my own case, I am not going beyond. I have finished the race. I can actually say with Paul, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So I am not continuing the race, continuing the fight. I will only continue it for a little while to get off all that I am told I must get off before the curtain comes down. Which, in my own case, without being sad about it, I personally hope it isn't too long. Personally. I hope it's not beyond the immediate present. That is my personal hope. But I do know we all coming on time, and we go on time. So I cannot tell anyone, because no one knows that hour, that moment. But the deep, and he doesn't reveal it to the surface mind, he simply reveals it at that moment when you go. But I, as a being still living on the surface for a little while, it would be my wish that it would not be long delayed. Could I finish it? I've done all that I am called upon to do. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Now return unto me the glory that was mine, the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. That's my prayer tonight. But I do hope that you will be encouraged, no matter what happens to you in the present or the future, to remember these words that you really are God the Father. If you are beaten down and you're ostracized and left alone, remember, you are God the Father. And remember my words, you are going to find your son who is God's son. 
And God's Son is going to call you Father, and you will know you really are God the Father. And whatever clothes you have worn, how tattered they might have been in the world, when you hear it, you will be clothed in your immortal body. It's a glorified body, a body that no one here on earth could ever describe. You can't describe it. How could I tell anyone what it is to stand in the presence of love? And yet it's man. But how could I find words to describe the God of a being who is wearing love? World of nature. Night after night I teach and tell the story of him who comes from above this world of nature. If you're here for the first time, it may seem strange, but you take it to heart and you dwell upon it, and you will find it in the end far more practical than all the things that our scientists can give you. For well, this is revelation. I did not come by it through reason. It was all revealed to me. And there's a vast difference between revealed truth and science. Revealed truth is wisdom. As defined in the scripture, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Science is knowledge based upon experiment. And we've done a wonderful job in the world of science. But what I've been saying to tell you is not science. It's simply revelation. The revelation of him who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no change in this being of whom I speak. He's called in scripture Jesus Christ, which is the Father and the Son. Jesus is the Lord. And Christ, his son. Jesus is the I am in man. His son, when you meet him, is personified. And you will know him, the eternal youth, David. After 3,000 years, he has an age, one iota. If you knew of one, and you take it as a chronological story, and you know that he lived 1000 BC, you would expect an old, old, old person. And yet I tell you, when you meet him, he is the youth, the eternal youth, in his team, and that is David. Have no concept about, will I know him? Oh, you will know him, because he never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why you will know him. You will know Jesus because you will be Jesus. As you're told in John, that is the first epistle of John, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall know him, because we shall be like him. You will be the being called Jesus, and Jesus is the Lord. And you will know him only when his son, David, the eternal youth, reveals you as his father. For David is the son of the Lord. Now last night, 
as is my custom, when my wife and I are separated, either if I'm traveling or she as it is today in the hospital, I invariably call her and give her a thought for meditation for the night. That is my habit. And so having called her last night around eight, she can't speak. But I asked for the floor and the head nurse and gave her just a thought. And the thought was, my steadfast love endures forever. Guess who I am. And then I didn't say anything. My wife wouldn't exactly who called. I said to the nurse, going and read this to her. Because she cannot speak to you. Just going and read it to her. And then I sat down next to my radio and turned on some lovely music. And then I took a theme. For as we are told, night brings counsel. And that's the proverb of all nations throughout the ages. If I would fill my mind with something, then the night should in some way unfold it to me. And so I took as my theme, those who sing my fall into division, and my regeneration to unity. My generation into decay and death and my regeneration into this immortal state. I fall into division and I am regenerated into unity. For during the night I had this discourse. There were old quite a few of us, as many say, as we have here. And there was one person present, a man not any taller than I am, but much heavier. He weighed at least 200 pounds, but strong, very strong physically. And he took issue with me. And I was telling him, I'm talking to myself. The whole vast world is myself pushed out. It's all myself pushed out. And you are only an aspect to my own being. But he seemed so completely free and independent by his attitude and his argument with me. That it would seem stupid to persist in telling him that he is the outpicturing of something within me that I cannot leave in the grave. That I cannot leave anyone in the grave. I must raise them and bring them home to where I am. Well, he laughed ironically. And then I said to him, what do you think is going to happen to you now when I awake? And so I awoke. And he vanished, as they all vanished. And I was alone in my home. The whole vast world, myself pushed out. And I have an obligation to take with me a certain number at this moment and simply not leave it behind and raise it. I cannot leave it in the grave. And so I am the resurrection and the life. I must prepare a way for my banished ones to return. And that way I will, for I am the way. There is no other way to the Father. There is only one way, and the way is Jesus Christ. Jesus being the I amness of man that is the Father, and Christ the Son that is David. And only David can reveal you as God the Father. Then my mind 
wandered off to something that I discussed that day with a friend of mine who took me and my wife to the hospital. So when we came back on the way up, we were discussing in the car on the way home. And I thought of this Spaniard, and I wish I could read Spanish, because if the English translation is as great as it is, what must it be in the original tongue of the Spanish tongue? He recently departed this world, but he must have had the most glorious concept because it's so poetically told. And he tells, and he begins it this way, this page will be no less a riddle than those of my holy books. And he only writes one page. This page will be no less a riddle than those of my holy books. Then he starts it, I who am the was, the is, and the is to come, descend to the written word, which is only time in succession. No more than an emblem. These things drop out of my eternity. They're only signs. And then he starts this perfectly lovely, I cannot quote it exactly because it's a whole long page, but I'll give you the essence. And then he starts this wonderful story. I knew, first of all, he said, I was born of a womb by an act of magic. I lived under a spell imprisoned in a body. I knew hope and fear, those twin faces of the uncertain future. I knew wakefulness, sleep, dream, ignorance, the flesh, reasons roundabout labyrinth. I knew the friendship of men and the blind devotion of dogs. I was loved, understood, prayed, and hung from a cross. I drank my cup to the drake. I knew bitterness as well. Sometimes homesick, I think back on the smell of that carpenter's shop. Now we tell you the beginning, it's a riddle. And this page is no less a riddle than the riddle of my holy book. And you take that apart, your mind becomes inflamed if you know the symbolism he has used in that one page. I think back sometimes when I'm homesick on the smell of that carpenter's shop. Well, the word carpenter, as you know, is associated with Jesus in the Bible. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not the carpenter? Well, the word carpenter in Scripture, by definition in the concordance, the biblical concordance, 
means to produce from seed as a woman as a tree as the earth you produce it from seed and here he is producing from the seed the immortal seed implanted within him he has to drink his cup to the very end drink it to the drink and no bitterness as well he knew all these things the flesh for he became flesh and dwelt within us he knew ignorance but everyone in this world knows ignorance he knows all the reasoning these roundabout reasoning and the labyrinthine states of reasoning he knew the friendship of men the blind devotion of a dog all these things he experienced and then he returned to where he was before enriched by the experience so i thought of those who sing allah fall into division and that i have experienced and they also sing our resurrection into unity and that i have experienced when that night at sea coming through the caribbean sea towards mobile alabama when i was lifted up on high and moved in some strange wonderful way like a spiral fiery spiral but completely out of this garment clothed in a garment of fire and air and here i saw this enormous sea of human imperfection and i simply glided by that's all i did i had no compassion i didn't do anything to change anyone in my world but as i came by to this huge sea of human imperfection they were blind they were lame they were halt they were deaf they were dumb you name it they had it and as i glided by everyone was transformed into that perfection that i felt springing within me and when i came to the very end and the last one was completely transformed as all the others were then that same heavenly chorus sang out it is finished and then again i felt, felt myself imprisoned in this body this body is a prison and that enormous being that glorious being that is perfect is imprisoned in it for a purpose and the day is coming that you will completely drain the cup and you will drink it to the dregs and when you've completed it you will be lifted up and you'll return to the glory that was yours before that the world was only enhanced by the experience of this world of death for this is a world of death everything decays everything dies in this world so you the immortal being came down into a world of death and took upon yourself the imprisoned form called man and here you move slowly imprisoned restricted and you experience death you experience decay and all the things that goes with it and one day you drain the cup and when you finish the cup then you are restored to your original state but greater than you were before the descent into this world so they sing your fall into this world of generation and they also sing it into your regeneration 
into the world from which you came. An actual choral group, and they'll call you by name. And you are the being spoken of in scripture as the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jehovah, the Lord called God. There is no other God. There is no God but the I amness within you. There is no other God. And he prepared the way for his banished ones, for all the banished ones to return. And the only way back is through his son. Until you find his son, you can't get back because you don't know who you are. You will only know who you are when the Son of God calls you Father. Then you will know you are God the Father. Outside of that, you will never know it. I can tell it to you from now to the ends of time. And maybe you will believe me. And maybe you will be hopeful. But as he said earlier, in this one page, I knew hope and fear. Those twin faces of the uncertain future. I hope he's telling me the truth. And yet it's mingled with fear. Have I done the right thing? You've done the right thing. You've gone through all of these things that he mentioned on that page. You've known the flesh and the weaknesses of the flesh. You've known the friendship of men. The blind devotion of the dogs. You've known all these things. But in the end, after you have drained the cup, you will turn up. For there is a river that makes happy the city of God. There is a river, and that river flows down, and it flows up. Read it in the 46th Psalm. This river, you're told, God is in the midst of it, and it shall not be moved. And that river is within you. It's not a thing on the outside. It's not the Nile. It's not any river in the world outside of man. The whole vast world is man pushed out. And that river is within you. And it comes down from above. I am from above. And that to which I go, it is from below. I come down into the world of generation to experience generation, which leads me into decay and death. And having played it all, then I turn around and move up once more to the top, bringing with me the sum total of the experiences of my descent into the written word. So he said, I now descend into the written word to make it alive. The written word is his holy Bible, his holy word. It's a sealed book for anyone who only has reason, no matter how wise he is in this world, as he reads it, it's a stupid book. They take it as history, and it's not secular history. It's the eternal history, something that is taking place forever and forever without change. The baby hasn't changed in the unnumbered years, and neither has the Lord. The same Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no change. And you think of someone today, if you met Abraham Lincoln, people think of Abraham Lincoln as he lived a hundred years ago. Well, hasn't he aged in a world would you expect to meet the same man that was assassinated? Wouldn't he have aged? Well, not in God's history. David remains the eternal youth. And the father is the eternal father. The ageless one. Without beginning, without end. And David never goes beyond the eternal youth. <coughs> 
bearing witness to your fatherhood. For you are God the Father, but you don't know it yet. You are sound, sound asleep, as the man in my dream of last night was sound asleep. And seemingly from his argument, independent of my perception of him. But I knew what I was doing. I was in complete control. And I knew wakefulness. And sleep. And dream. And ignorance. And the flesh. And all these roundabout labyrinthine's way of the reasoning mind. So I knew exactly what I'm looking at. But I knew I could not leave him, only for a moment I would explain. And then I said, and when I now awake, where do you think you will be? And so I awoke, and the whole thing vanished. To return where? To leave them on the outside? No. To return to me. All that I behold, though it appears without, it is within, within my own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. It's the shadow world. All these are but signs dropped from my eternity. And they are telling me something. Everything is telling me something. So he begins his wonderful page, and he said, they're only emblems. But you know what an emblem is? An emblem is simply a visible object which reveals something other than what it appears to be. You go to Washington, D.C., and you wonder, I wonder if the president is in the White House. Well, look to see if his emblem is flying. If it's flying, he is in residence. He's not the flag. And you're looking at a flag, but it conveys a different idea. When he is in residence, that flag flies. When he's not, it is lowered. So you see a flag. And to the average person, it's only a flag. And they see an emblem. So that's the president's emblem. But they do not know what it signifies. It signifies his presence when it flies over the White House. Like a battleship that carries, or may, maybe it could be a destroyer. It could even be something less than the destroyer who carries the admiral of the fleet, depending where he wants to be centered. And the admiral's flag is flying, and if it's there, that's where the admiral is. So these are emblems. These are signs dropped into this world of death from my eternity. So I who am the was, the is, and the is to be, descend to the written word, to fulfill the written word, for there are only emblems, and no one knows the meaning until the living word descends, so the word became flesh and dwelled within us. And as it became flesh and dwelled within us, it gave meaning to the word. For the word that we translate, Logos is translated as the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word, Logos meant when it was used 2,000 years ago, what we mean today by the word reality. So reality comes down. You can't change it. It's forever. And then assumes flesh. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt within us. Now, to the scientific mind, and the philosophic mind, these rational minds, it doesn't make sense. So let them go their way. It's perfectly all right. And if we confuse the wisdom of revealed truth with the knowledge of science, then we are in deep water. You'll never, never understand it. So let them go their way. Eventually, they will have all that they can possibly do in what is known as knowledge. 
It hasn't gotten them anyway. So we get more and more gadgets, more and more things, more and more things to destroy the world. Whether we pollute it, or we destroy it by bombs, or do anything with it, we're getting more and more. The rich get richer, and the poor get more of their own property. And so, we go on and on, and not a person has arisen to solve the knowledge of man. It doesn't matter, because we aren't here for that purpose. We came down into this world. We are immortal beings. To drain the cup to the very drain. And to experience what it is to be in a world of death and decay. And the choral group sings your fall, may I tell you. They sing your fall into division. When all of a sudden, it all comes out in a world, and you see a world not knowing it, yourself pushed out. They sing your fall into division, and all that was contained within you is completely externalized as a world that differs from you, and you don't know it. But they also sing your resurrection into unity, when you bring them all back. And they're all redeemed within you. So this is the story that I have been sent to tell you. I am not making it up. I am not manufacturing it. I am telling you exactly what has been revealed to me. And so when I called her and gave her just a thought for the night, I know it would amuse her. And she would know exactly who it was who said this love relative to her endures forever. And this morning she went under the knife. But through the night she could dwell upon it until she from sheer exhaustion would sleep. And so then I turn to this theme of unity in division. And they sing my fall. And the chorus is altogether heavenly, may I tell you. And when they sing your resurrection into unity, what a choral group. And then you come to the end of it all before you begin to tell it. And you feel yourself at the very end when the last one is completely transformed into perfection. And then you feel yourself imprisoned in a body. So this Spaniard was telling it in the most beautiful way. I only wish I could read Spanish to read it in its original tongue. But the translation into English is so altogether beautiful that I accept that and take it for what it is. But he wrote it in his own tongue, and this is only a translation. And he based it on one little thought, the 14th verse of the first chapter of John. And the word became flesh and dwelt, as he said, among us. But the word among is really the preposition in and dwelt in us. That's where he dwells. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? If he is in me, where am I looking for him to come? He cannot come from without. There is no one coming from without. It's all from within my own wonderful imagination. And that's where God is. So there is a river that makes glad the city of God. And this city, he dwells in the midst of this river and this city. And it shall never be moved. His most, I would say, high habitation, we are told. The habitation of the Most High. Then in that same 46th Psalm, it tells us, Now be still and know that I am God. A man is still, and he can't even still his mind. So, put you in a straight jacket is not to make you still, 
can you still your mind to the point where it actually is so still that you can have the revelation. The mind is so busy all the time trying to work out something, trying to defeat what the other fellow said, trying to disprove him. And there are those who will come here for the purpose of disproving, like the picture being last night. And he, my own being pushed out, he is going to challenge my right to say that they're all myself pushed out. And he was big and strong, not taller than I am, I'm 5'11", and he was the same height, but strapping, about 200 odd pounds. Giant of a man. And he was insolent, but he is myself, looking for the challenge. And I said, all right, wait and see. Now, if I awake, where do you think you will be? And so I awoke, and I was alone. I only outpicked it in my dream. It's an egocentric world, beautifully told in dream. And here I am outpicturing my own being. And that one to be redeemed. I have to take him back. I cannot leave him in the gnawing grave. So I have prepared the way for my banished ones to return. And there is no other way to return to what? To God the Father. And who is God the Father? The I am in you. That's God the Father. You'll never get back and know that I am He until His Son stands before you and calls you Father. And that Son is David of biblical fame. And when you see David, he has an age. He is the eternal youth. Eternity is personified as youth. Man not knowing that they personify eternity as an old man with a scythe gathering people. That's not the true personification of eternity. It's youth. The ancient of days, yes, has no beginning, no end. And yet you can call him old, you can call him young. He is the ancient of days. When you stand in his presence, here is the ancient of days. Infinite love. That's what he is. He embraces you, incorporates you into his being, and you are one with the Ancient of Days, who is the Lord God Jehovah. And that is Jesus. And now he sends you into the world to finish the cup. And now you'll drain it, and you will drain it to the very end. And you will know bitterness as well. For joy and woe, are woven fine, a garment for the soul divine. It's not all joy, it's not all woe, it's not all sweet, it's not all bitterness. In the Hebraic marriage ceremony, there are two glasses of wine, one sweet, one bitter, or at least it's dry. But there's always more of the sweet. And then they drain it. And when they drink it, then the rabbi steps upon the glasses and crushes them. That's the end of the drama. That's all symbolism, beautiful symbolism. But that's the story. And that's life. So I am telling you what I know from my own experience. And this tonight may seem far out. And yet I tell you, if you dwell upon it, while you are dwelling upon it, trying to unravel the riddle, earthly things are taking place to your advantage. You put all your mind in unraveling a job, how to get more money out of it, how to make more out of it, and all these things, it's a waste of time. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. Your Heavenly Father knows your need. So, seek what he offers you. Leave these things alone. And they'll all add up. In the end, you'll be amazed how it happened. It all comes into focus, and you're reaping earthly benefits. 
by giving your attention to the heavenly story. So here, by simply dwelling upon it, the answer came during the night, the outfit itself. The one opponent, always opponent, and then, to your own satisfaction, because there's no one else to satisfy, you awoke to find they all vanished anyway. And where do they go? They can't go off into space. They return to you. For one night, you push them out and commune with them to explain what's taking place within you. For only one man fell. And he carried with him all. Read the 82nd Psalm. And one man fell. And that one man carried all. And then in the fall he became fragmented. And this is the fragmented one man pushed out in the world. And that one man has to return redeeming himself. And that one is God. And there's nothing but God. So tonight, dwell upon it, as I did last night. And if today you had a problem, and it was a financial problem, or some little problem in your household, it will all be solved, it will be resolved. But to put all of your attention upon that little problem, and work on it in this little sphere of knowledge, where are you going to get? While you are doing God's work, Caesar's world collapses and reforms itself in harmony with what you are doing within you. I know from experience that's how it works. So here I can pinpoint that page. I know the man's name, if I pronounce the Spanish correctly, it's Jorge Louis Borge. For those who speak Spanish, it's J-O-R-G-E. And then Louis, L-O-U-I-S, and B-O-R-G-E-S, who departed this world only recently. He writes beautifully. His prose is really poetry. And his native tongue is Spanish. Well, I can't speak Spanish or read Spanish. But if the translation into my tongue, which is English, is as beautiful as it is, what must be the original? Because don't tell me that translations do not lose something in the inflection, in the mood, in the translation, because they do. When someone tells me that they can translate Shakespeare into German and make it more beautiful than you can in the original tongue of English, I start laughing. Any more than I would take the great German poets when they were thinking in those words and then translate them into English and expect the English translation to equal it. No. If one could read Hebrew with understanding, I'm quite sure that the Psalms will be so altogether different, yet we have a marvelous translation in English. But if it's so great in English, just imagine what it must be in the original town. When this inspired being is penning his words. So I tell you, when you go out tonight, dwell upon it. When you say, I am, that's God. There is no other God. And you will laugh at that thought if you're here for the first or second time. And it seems arrogant. Here is a little man on a platform trying to persuade me that my own wonderful human imagination is God creating the universe and sustaining it. And so you laugh. It's perfectly all right. I will not retract one word that I said. 
I only wait, and time will prove me true. You will discover who you are. And when you discover who you are, you'll discover that you are the being I tell you that you are. You are God the Father. But you will not in eternity know that you are God the Father until his son David calls you Father. There is no other way of knowing it. So that's the way that man returns. So I have prepared the way for my banished ones to return. And I am the way. The way to what? The way to the Father. So when you see me, you will know the Father. For the minute you see me, then you will know you are the Father. That's what he's saying. You cannot see me and not know the Father, for it takes the Son to reveal the Father. And you aren't going to see Jesus, you're going to see David. Because you are the Lord Jesus. That's the one that came down. Bringing with him his son. Who will do all his will. And you have done his will. You've played all the parts. And in the very end. When you drain the cup. Right to the very end. All the drain. Leaving this the great. And had both the bitter and the sweet. Then you will awake. And you will depart this world. Not to be restored to life in a world just like this, as the whole vast world will be. You will ascend to the point where you were before your descent. But no one ascends into heaven but he who first descended. There's only one way down and one way up.